We're starting a series, and、uh, it's all about the Bible characters. And、um, I'm really excited about this. In the next few weeks, we're going to look at some different、uh, people in the Bible and what we could learn about them and their lives and what we could learn. And today, we're going to look at the life of David. And、uh, the Bible tells us that, he was, that he, he was a man after God's own heart. Now, think about that for a moment. Just let that sink in. A man after God's own heart. Hmm, really interesting. So,、um, but before I start,、uh, because there's a connection that I'm going to be talking about regarding the heart. The heart.、Uh, so, l- listen to this.、Uh, our heart is really amazing, the physical heart. L- look at this. It, it will、uh, blow you away. Look at this. Listen, the human heart is a hard working marvel. It can keep on beating automatically even if all other nerves were severed. In a 70 year lifetime, 70 year lifetime, 40 million times a year or two and a half billion times, at each beat, the average adult heart discharges about four ounces of blood. Okay? Stay with me. This amounts to 3,000 gallons a day. Or 650,000 gallons a year. 650,000 gallons a year. Enough to fill more than 81 tank cars of 8,000 gallons each. The heart, does not, the, the heart does enough work in one hour, listen, to lift a 150 pound man. To the top of a three story building. That's insane. It exerts enough energy in 12 hours to lift a 65 ton tank car one foot off the ground. Is that insane? Or enough power in 70 years to lift the largest battleship afloat completely out of the water. What comes to mind when you hear things like this? God created your heart, a single piece of our body, amazingly. And you're like, what? God created my heart like that? Yeah. The heart is so vital.、Um, here's what I know my dad、um, had some heart issues, and he had. Uh, a heart surgery prior to his death. And、uh, so, because of the, the heart issue, every time I go to the doctor, knowing the past, they would constantly look at my heart because it runs in my family. And so, every year that I go to the doctor, they look at my heart. And, and the heart is so vital, it's so important. In fact, Pastor Geraldine's mom. Um, just got out, I think, from the hospital. Is she out? But because of the heart condition, it's a serious thing. It's a serious thing. But do you know that there's another part of us, what we call a spiritual heart? Not, I'm not talking about the physical heart, even though it's important. You know how valuable your heart and mind is. But there is much more valuable, which is the spiritual heart. A man after God's own heart, God called this man, David, a man after God's own heart. That was his title. Do you know that in the Bible there are so many people that were given titles? For example,、uh, Abraham was called a father of many nations, Jeremiah was called a weeping prophet, John was called uh, you know, uh, the Baptist, Peter was called the rock. So, in my family, our, our family is kind of weird. Growing up from the Philippines, I, you know, I came here when I was really young, but I remember、uh, our family. So, seven of us, we had literally names, like we were given titles. So, I was given a title in Tagalog.、Uh, they, they, called me, they would call me Pute. And Pute it simply means this it's white. <laughs> And because、uh, my hair, when I was a kid, my hair. And my, my skin was so light that they would call me white or pute. 
And that's basically, so I, you know, I just got back from the Philippines for about a month and seeing my cousins for a day, you know what? They still called me pute. And I'm like, dude, I'm 40, uh, you know, uh, 40, I, I got stuck in 40. And, and so, and they, you know, dude, I, I'm an adult. You still called me as if I was still a kid, you know? And then my brother, my other brother, what's called mata. And mata, it simply means big eyes. I mean, literally, my brother Art, he's got big eyes. And so he was called mata. My other brother was called pa'a. And pa'a means big feet. Now, now this is a funny one. My, my, brother, my other brother, my oldest brother was called Tache. And Tache, it's funny. One day he was walking, uh, going home, and a bird, bird, out of nowhere, just pooped. And the poop landed on his head. And everybody started calling him Tache, which is poop. <laughs> How do you like that? And so David was given a title, a man after God's own heart. Now, I know, think about that for a moment. A man after God's own heart. Um, it's really interesting that he was given this title. Now, before I move on, I got to give you a background so that we all understand uh, where we're coming from and what this message is all about. Israel asked for a king. And God basically said, you're asking for a king, and I sh- why are you asking for a king? I'm your king. But because they wanted a king, all right, I'll give you a king, and Saul was chosen to be the first king in Israel. But unfortunately, Saul didn't do a good job leading. His heart wasn't right. In fact, God gave him a command And he did what we see in the Bible about 99%. I mean, he did a pretty good job. But God still rebuked him. And God ended up taking him out of his position. He ended up dying. And here's what we know. It's really interesting that God said, look at this, uh, through the prophet Samuel. He's talking about... Samuel was talking to Saul. Now, now, look at this. In 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 14. It's really interesting. But now your kingdom will not endure. He said that to King Saul. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. Now, now look at me. God sought out a man after his own heart. So in other words, God was just looking and seeking for someone a man that, that is just seeking him, and he found David. Now, this is really interesting because I wonder, though, if he's looking around here today, would God say that to us about you and about me? That he's a man after my own heart. Hmm. Why, was, why do you think that David was given that title? Well, we know this. David was a man of faith. David was in love with God. In fact, when he was a young kid, uh, we know this for a fact, that, that his faith was amazing when he killed the, 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 the bear and the lion. I mean, his faith in God was amazing. That he, he's, he's so in love with God that he wrote a lot of the Psalms. I mean, just looking at what he wrote, I mean, you can tell that this young man loved God. So God began to seek And looked around, and he was chosen. He said, that man, he's a man after my own heart. And so, but here's what we know. Here's something to think about. That the question I want to point out is this, and those that are watching, I I want you to pay attention to this question. Do you have to be perfect in order to be a man after God's own heart? Now think about that. Do you have to be perfect in order to be a man after God's own heart? Obviously, the answer is no, because we know that David was a man after God's own heart, but he hmm, committed some terrible, terrible sin. Back in those days, you know, kings would go into battle. You know, they, you don't just stay behind and come like, I'm just going to hang out in my castle. No, 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 no. You go. Can you just imagine if I tell you as a leader, hey, 
why don't you go out there and do all this, you know, community stuff, and I'm just going to hang out and just enjoy my day drinking iced tea. How would you like that? So leaders, especially back in those days, when, when, when they would go into battle, kings has to go, but David decided, eh, I'm just going to let them go. I'm just going to hang out here. And so that's what he did. And so he started walking around on top of the roof, and then all of a sudden, I don't know why there was a woman bathing next to the castle, and somehow David saw Bathsheba, ooh, naked woman. And then he tells his servant, go get her. And the servant was like, uh, king, I just want to let you know. You, I don't think you should have her. And why? Uh, because he's married to Uriah. Well, let me think about that. Well, I still want her, go get her. Takes Bathsheba, kills Uriah, the husband. That's pretty intense. I don't know about you, but that's pretty, pretty intense. And so here's what we know. That the king knew that that would be a big no-no. And basically his attitude was, I'm the king. I want to do what I want to do, and I'm going to do it. Go get her. But it seems like, is it possible that that's your attitude and my attitude? Like, I know that's wrong, but I still want to do what I want to do. Come on now. You know that, that what you're doing is wrong, and you're still saying, eh, Oh well, I still want to do it. And God tells you, you probably don't want to do that. And so here's a man after God's own heart and committed a great sin. So we're going to pause for a moment. How many of you have driven to Tahoe? Knowing the windy road. Come on, how many of you have driven to Tahoe? Okay, most of you. How many of you who you don't drive, but you were a passenger? Okay. So here's what we know about Tahoe, on the way to Tahoe, from here to Tahoe. Especially when you take 395. Is that still 395? No, 580 now. I still love the old 395. All right, so go here. But now it's 580. But just in case you don't know, it's, it wasn't 580, it was 395. All right, you with me? Okay. So we know this. If you take that route, it's pretty windy. If you take 80, it's fine. But if you take the, the 580 or 395, it's pretty windy. So let me ask you this question. If you're going up, right, and you can't, it's pretty windy, would you say, hey, look at all this beautiful trees and just scenery. I'm going to park here. And I'm just going to get out and I'm just going to look around, and I'm just going to enjoy myself, and just enjoy the scenery. That would be the most dumbest thing a person could do. Agree? Agree? Because, dude, if I park here, and then I'm like, oh, look at this, uh, that means that probably something is going to come and kill me. Right? No, no, look. Do you know that every day, Christians are parking their lives in sin, knowing that it would only bring death and destruction? Would you agree with me that it's kind of the, the most dumbest thing we could do is to park in a very windy road of sin. It just leads to death and destruction. But a lot of Christians are ignoring the conviction of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit tells you, don't go there. Don't park there. It's not going to be good. It's not going to be good. But we demand, I am going to do what I want to do. If that's your attitude, God would say, okay, that's what you want to do. I'm going to let you. But I just want you to know, if that's your attitude, my blessings can be there. Agree? How could God bless a life that is 
sinful. Really. God can bless it. He calls us to a place of holiness and righteousness. A life that is completely surrendered. Are you with me? And here's what we know. That David paid the consequences of his sins. Paid a big consequence. When Nathan the prophet came and said, what you did is not good, King. It's not good. Look at this. Look, let's look at the passage real quick. In the book of 2 Samuel chapter 12, it tells us this. Verse 7. This is what the Lord God of Israel says. Um, I anointed you king over Israel and rescued you from Saul. That's what I did. I gave you your master Saul's house and his wives. I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if this is weren't enough, I would have given you even more. Why did you despise my word by doing what I considered evil? Mm, 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 mm. Why did you despise my word by doing what I considered evil? I wonder, though, how many Christians today know they know that what they're doing is evil, and yet they completely would ignore about God's conviction. Friends, I, I, I just want to just encourage you. It doesn't work in God with God. It doesn't work with him. He calls us to a life of holiness and righteousness because because he knows that if we park our life in this winding road of sin, we're going to pay the price. This death and destruction, that's all he's going to give you. God's blessing is it can't be there. But when you do decide to surrender your life to God and you say, God, Holy Spirit, I need your help. Let me live a life of honor, honoring you, and let me live a life of obedience. Let me just really surrender to you. Because I know, God, that you will only lead me to life. That's why when we're going the wrong direction, he, tell, he says, wait, 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 don't go there. Don't ever, ever ignore God's conviction. I, I was reading up this morning, um, and, and one of the things I read was this, that if you live in the graveyard long enough, you stop crying when someone dies. If you live in a graveyard long enough, too long, you stop crying when someone dies. Meaning, let me just say it to where we would understand it. That when we allow ourselves to live in sin long enough, we stop listening to God's conviction. And we stop, we just completely would ignore it. So I just want to let you know, friends, it is a serious thing. And... uh, So what could we learn from David? What could we learn from David? When David was was confronted by the prophet Nathan, do you know what he did? He simply said, I have sinned against my God. In the book of Psalm 51, he wrote it with his, basically his heart was remorseful, And his heart was so broken that he repented of his sins. He basically said, create in me a pure heart. Do not take away the Holy Spirit. Please, I'm asking you, God, please, I'm asking you, I'm begging you, forgive me. So, here, being remorseful is good, but without Jesus, it's not good. I'll tell you, I'll give you an example. What am I talking about? Judas was remorseful, but he didn't turn to Jesus, and he ended up killing himself. On the other hand, Peter was remorseful, and he turned to Jesus, and he was, what? Restored to his position. 
And so just because you're remorseful does not mean anything. Being remorseful, you got to turn to Jesus. Are you with me? Friends, a man after God's own heart, you don't have to be perfect. I don't have to be perfect, but here's the thing. When I sin against him, I have some things to do. God showed me what to do. God showed you what to do. In the book of 1 John chapter 1, beginning from verse 9, tells us simply this, that if you confess your sin, confess, not making excuses, right? Because a lot of times when we sin against God and God convicts us, oh God, oh, you know, I'm just a sinner, blah, blah, blah. No, 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 no. Just man up and just say, you know, if you lie, you just say, I'm a liar. I'm a liar. If you took something that, is, that does not belong to you, you are a what? A thief. You just say, I'm a thief. And if you just looked at pornography, well, guess what? You just got to be honest. I don't know if it's the word luster. I'm a luster. I don't know. Is that a word? Well, you know, I just a man... I, I just lust, right? Whatever. I, I don't know what the word is, luster. I'll just make a word, luster. Let's just keep that. And, and so what I'm saying is, for instance, we just got to be real with God. God knows everything in a way. He knows you. He knows. He sees everything. And here, we would do a lot of dumb things in thinking, oh, I could hide from my sin. I could hide this. I, I have my secret hidden sin that nobody could know. And God is looking. Seriously? You don't think that I don't see what you're doing? I just want to remind you, I'm God and I see everything. And I know everything. David was just real. He knew that he sinned against God. He humbled himself. He became so remorseful. And then guess what? Repentance. So repentance is not making excuses. Repentance is just is is not just asking for forgiveness. Stay with me. Asking God for forgiveness is just half of the equation. Right? How many how many of us have asked God to forgive us? Right? And then we turn around and do the same thing. Come on now. Right? Okay. Thanks for being honest. I'm guilty. Yeah. Some of you are Jesus. <laughs> Just perfect. And uh, so here, repentance. So here's the process. When you sin against God, because of his love, he will come and convict you and me. Agree? That's not my will. That's not good. That w- that's going to lead you to death and destruction. Come back, right? So when God convicts, what do we do? We humble ourselves. We become so real about our sin. I'm a liar. I'm a thief. I'm a luster. And then we become remorseful. But then, guess what? We turn to Jesus. We look at our sin and say, Jesus, I'm turning to you. I'm humbling myself. I'm real. Just being real. I'm a liar. I'm a thief. And I'm repenting, meaning I'm going towards Jesus. The sin that I used to live is no longer in control of my life. We sang the song, whatever the cost may be. I wonder though, whatever the cost, even if you have to say, man, but if I do this, if I do the right thing, guess what I'm, what I'm going to lose? Well, guess what? Don't let the enemy lie to you. Because what you're going to lose here, you can't compare what you're going to lose here. I'd rather turn around and just say, we're going to do things right. I'm going to do things right. Because it's going to honor God. And it's going to bring me life. I just want to encourage you today, friends. David was a man after God's own heart. But he was a mess. But just because he was a mess doesn't mean that he stopped being a man after God's own heart. It was all about his heart. That's why the book of Proverbs tells us that guard this. Why? Because everything flows out of it. Agree? Everything flows from here. 
everything. And um, so let me just end with this, friends. That really, God wants the heart. He, he doesn't want your mouth or my mouth. Don't we do a good job of that? Just, we come every Sunday, we sing songs, we say the right things, you know, praise God, God is good. God is not so concerned about that. He's just concerned simply about your heart and mind. And um, here's what we know. Remember this, friends. That you don't have to be perfect to be a man after God's own heart. But your heart must be pure. Meaning, when you sin against God and Him, we just got to humble ourselves and realize we've sinned against God and not ignoring His conviction. Are you with me? I want to remind you, friends, God wants to lead you to life, not death and destruction. For the wages of sin is what? Death. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. The wages of sin is death. It's a real serious stuff, isn't it? And so this morning, somebody think about, right? My heart, your heart. Where is it at? I wonder, though, how long have we parked our lives or this life, your life, in sin? In this windy road sin. I wonder, how long has it been? God has been saying to you, that's not my will. Repent of your sins. Change your direction, and you're not willing. And uh, friends, I just want to let you know, if you, do, if you continue to do that, you're missing out. You're missing out, big time. I know, I've shared my, I've shared you know, a lot of what I needed to let go in my life. But I was just like, God, if I let go of this relationship, but guess what? When God told me to let go of that relationship and I met Annalisa, right? My wife, for the last 20, 23, 24 years. If I, if I wasn't willing to, I was so in love with this gal I wanted to marry her, and God said to me, she's not my will. But, I, but God, she's not my will. Can you imagine if I pursued her? I told Annalisa this, and a lot of my friends, if I, that knows her, if, I, if we pursued that, we would be divorced today. I, I wouldn't be in, the, in ministry. But because I said, God, if that's your will, let me go to your best. And then Annalisa came to me and just asked me out and was just told me how much she really likes me. She's not here, so I can say that. <laughs> but friends, there's just so many things. God said, let go of your dream. Let go of this attitude that you're going to climb up the ladder. You're going to be one day in corporate level position. But God, let go of it. I got a calling for your life. Okay, God. And I'm so glad I did. It's if I held on to that and I pursued that, I would have missed out. And today you wouldn't have your amazing pastor if I... No, just kidding. Thanks, thanks for the clap. I paid him. I paid him. I paid this guy. So yeah. So, <laughs> but do you see what I'm saying? God is saying, I want to bless you. You're missing out just because you want to hold on to that sin. Let it go because I got something better for you. Right? I'm going to invite the worship team to come back up. God wants your heart in my heart, right? That's it. He doesn't want anything. He just wants your heart in my heart. And uh, this morning, friends, I don't know. Maybe you're here today. 
Maybe God needs you to take you to the operating table. I don't know. Maybe. He just needs to do this operation of transforming your heart. But it's a good thing. It's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. Maybe you're here today and you're like, man, God, hmm, I parked my life in this windy, windy sin. But I heard you, God. I heard you. I just want to humble myself. I'll call, I call it for what it is. Yeah, I'm a liar. I'm a thief. I'm a fornicator, whatever, right? I just love to lust, whatever the case may be. One thing I know, friends, God wants to do an operation. It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing because it brings... Here's what I know. If he doesn't do the operation in your heart, God is saying you might die spiritually. He doesn't want that. He came so that you can have life, right? He came so that you can have life and have it in great abundance. But I know this, God knows, and God is saying to us, you can't have my life in great abundance unless you surrender your heart. How many here have parked your life in this windy road of sin? And God is saying to you, it's time, son. It's time, my daughter, to look at your life. Get inside your vehicle and start driving to my will. My will is life. My will is for you to experience this incredible life that I promised you. Life of victory, life of courage, a life of peace and joy, a life of freedom, life in great abundance. But you're missing out just because you're parked. You had parked your life for so long in this winding road of sin. God is giving us an opportunity. Would you agree? And those that are watching, I just want you to pause for a moment and just engage with us. Because I really believe that God wants to move your heart. He wants to move my heart. He just simply wants your heart. 